Hey, everybody, and welcome to Boss Talks. This is episode 55. We got a great guest this week, David Lorenzen. He is out of Houston, Texas, and he is a recruiter for the multifamily industry. Uh, he's been at it for quite a while, 11 years, over 11 years, and he's passionate about helping people find that next great gig and helping, obviously, companies find that right fit prospect or uh, employee. But today we're going to talk about a few things that I think would be very helpful for those that are looking for a job or just on the everyday figuring out, you know, what is my next move and thinking about, hey, probably should keep things updated like your resume and your profile on LinkedIn and maybe working on your personal brand. And, uh, and also the other notable thing is just your health. Because if you don't have good health, what good is it in anything else, right? Like can't really enjoy life or anything, but he has a personal story about that as well. So excited to bring him to the show. But before I do, I'm Evan Happel, your host. Uh, this is Boss Talks and I am with Community Boss. We have a great solution that helps you manage the physical spaces of your community, whether that's your parking, your amenities, or some kind of mapping that you need. We got you covered, generate some revenue, and value to your community. So if you have any questions about that, let me know and I would love to answer them. But today we are bringing David to the show. All right, David, thanks for being here. Now, I just wanna warn everyone, I may dab my, I feel like a, a preacher in church. Um, I'm gonna dab my forehead because I'm out in the garage and it's a little warm. So, <laughs> that's hilarious. And it doesn't help that I I also worked out uh, about an hour ago, and apparently my body hasn't cooled off either. <laughs> so, anyways, just a little housekeeping for everybody that's joining, and they see me dripping or whatever. And that's that's why <laughs> I'm outside. <laughs> But David, thank you for being here. Thanks for jumping on and joining Boss Talks today. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, Evan. I appreciate it. And everybody's going to be sending you towels now so you can wipe oh, them off gosh. better. <laughs> 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 I'll just drink a lot of drink a lot of liquid. Here we go. Um, hey, but that's a that's a trick in, in Houston right now. Everybody carries a towel, so you're you're you'd be popular uh, in Houston because you walk yeah, outside, I'm, you start sweating. Yeah, yeah. I and I can't complain. I know Stephanie, she's down in uh, Florida. She's experiencing the same thing, really hot with humidity. You and you in uh, Miami, Houston and Miami probably are in the same boat right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, most of the country, I feel like, is in this boat. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's not a good time to be outside. That's for sure. I don't know. Right. <laughs> yeah. But, but no, thanks for having me. Um, you know, I, I love the show. I love what y'all are doing with the show. I love your authenticity and and bringing everybody on that you can. And uh, I just want to say to start that that I appreciate what you're doing, and and I know a lot of other people appreciate it as well. Well, I appreciate your appreciation. <laughs> but I will say, Evan, let me tell you this: your hair. I am really jealous of your hair. Okay. Like, I was going back and looking at old episodes and you have a different hairstyle in a lot of these episodes. <laughs> and I want somebody to take like photos of your, your, your head and, and put like a collage of the different <laughs> hairstyles of Evan. I hope somebody does that. Please. Now they will. You know, who's going to do that. It's going to be Stephanie. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, I'm losing my hair. You've got a great head of hair. Oh goodness. Yeah. Well, I did just get a haircut and when I don't, I, I get to a point where it's too long and I don't really like what it looks like. So then that's when the hat comes on. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's the trick. You got to bring in the hat. Yeah. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. Stephanie, I guess that's your task. I think you're the only one here that heard that. So um, other people will jump on. This is the early stages. This is the warm up session of the, of the show. <laughs> but <laughs> Just like, just like every show, I have three questions to ask. Uh, I kick it off with the question about how is it that you personally and professionally build community? Uh, well, 
professionally, I do that through networking. I try to talk with as many people as possible and uh, learn about their background, learn about their story. I really believe every single person has a story and growing my community is, is just, you know, also encouraging people. I and mean, that can be on social media or in person and, and association events or things like that. But being a part of the community is also encouraging others uh, through like comments or posts or showing appreciation for what they do. And I really think that's important uh, for everybody. I mean, yeah. everybody yeah. likes to, to get a compliment. And so yeah. growing your community and supporting each other is, is, is crucial. And then personally, I am involved in a lot of different things. Uh, I don't talk about it a whole lot, but you know, I'm involved in different exercise groups, different run groups. Um, and then through like recovery efforts and things like that, I'm involved in, and do a lot of conferences and retreats on a volunteer basis. And, uh, and I really get a lot of joy out of that. And I love helping people <laughs> professionally and personally. Uh, so that's how I try to build community. No, that's great. Yeah. And, and I think we're going to get into a little bit more in depth about some of that, um, both with your, your efforts in your physical health, um, both, both through running and other aspects as well. So yeah. we'll get there, but, uh, yeah, thanks for sharing. And then the next thing I like to see how people bring about hospitality, bringing people together and what dish or meal they would serve somebody in order to, to achieve that. Wow. What dish or meal would I serve? Well, being from Texas, I mean, I would serve like steak and potatoes and, um, you know, some greens, okra is, I love okra, um, um, but barbecue, any kind of barbecue and okra and potatoes, uh, and any kind of, you know, green beans, asparagus, that kind of stuff. Um, I'm a big steak meat guy <laughs> for any okay. of those vegetarians out there, but, uh, yeah. um, that's what I would cook. I, I, All right. Like, Nice. Yeah, you get all so are you a, do you, um, how do you go about cooking it? Do you use a gas grill, charcoal? Do you use a smoker? Do you use a Traeger? What, what's your way? Well, it depends on for steaks. I mean, I use a charcoal grill. Um, obviously wood would be the best if you can do it and smoke it. But for, uh, time purposes, I use charcoal. Yeah. Okay. Definitely not gas. No, no gas. No gas. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'll go get a charcoal grill if you ever come to my house. <laughs> there you go. Let's go. Let's do it. I have a Weber Weber gas grill. So oh, nice. it was a gift. I didn't have a say in the matter. It just showed up in my house. So I use it. <laughs> hey, Weber's great. Weber's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In, I mean, you are in Texas. So I think it'd be weird to be in Texas. And I'm sure there are people that are in this boat, but that don't like barbecue, but live in Texas. I mean, oh. that would be. <laughs> that yeah. Would be there's there's a tough. lot of vegetarians in, uh, in Texas. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially up in the, like, the Fort, Worth, Fort Worth area. That would be real tough. Um, yeah. Just surrounded by the, the cows and cowboys, probably not the ideal place. <laughs> um, and then finally, when it comes to your caffeinated beverage of choice, do you swing coffee or do you do something else? I drink coffee. Do you like Lovely. any specific kind of beverage of coffee? Like, do you do you like a something at Starbucks or just straight black? No, I buy the coffee and make it myself in the morning. Uh, typically it's from a uh, Latin American country and like my wife's from Costa Rica, so we got to have the Costa Rica coffee, but Colombia, okay. um, okay. or Mexico and Chiapas and Oaxaca, but, uh, yeah, no, I buy it myself and make it nice. 
Yes. I like I like a good cup of black coffee. So you get the right beans and just do it yourself. I'm not somebody that yeah. goes and buys coffee every single day. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, you save a lot of money doing it yourself, too. There's that. That's for sure. All right. All right, David, thanks for answering those questions. Now, I just want to actually start off a little bit about your just background. How did you get into what we're what you do now? Uh, have you always this is where you started and where you're at? Or did you start somewhere else like out of college or anything like that? Um, out of college, I started with Enterprise rent uh, Okay, renting cars and then around the Houston area. Um, which is interesting, you know, when I first started in real estate in 2014, there was a company, I think it was Amco, it was one of the big publicly held companies. They recruited from enterprise to the apartment industry, huh. to operations. Interesting. Um, nobody's really doing it these days, but uh, the training and the sales and the, and the rental aspect of it, they thought transferred over really well. Yeah. And, um, but no, I worked for enterprise and was out at a local branch for a while and worked my way up and ended up at the airports at Intercontinental Airport oh. and was a manager there. Um, but the hours were insane. You know, you work yeah. Christmas, you know, cause they were always open every day of the year. There was no break in the operations. You work Christmas, Thanksgiving. Sometimes you could be working at 2 a.m. and two days later you're working at four, you start at 4 a.m. And so the sleep schedule was just out of whack. And yeah, no, sh for sure. And I had a buddy who had gone from enterprise into recruiting in Houston. And he said, listen, this is Monday through Friday. And, you know, you, you got quality of life. And uh, so why don't you come try it? And I said, oh, why not? Yeah. And, and so I started in 2012 in recruiting and I started in healthcare. We were doing back office administration, temporary staffing in healthcare in the Houston area. And it was, it was good. Um, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the people, but I was driving everywhere and mm. like it was an hour and a half. I don't know if you ever driven in traffic in, in Houston, Texas, but, um, not you can spend an hour and a half and still be in Houston and <laughs> not have gone very far. Yeah. So, and then I was driving around to the hospitals and the clinics in the Houston area for work. So it was just, it was, it was intense. Um, and so South Coast Partners was on the north side of Houston near where I was living. And I, I liked the idea of really, Estate. I like the idea of working executive direct hire type roles. And so I interviewed with them, like the people, love the people. They've been around. South Coast Partners have been around since 93. And so they've been through a lot of the ups and downs of the industry and, and the recessions and things like that. So, and there were great people that had worked there for a long time. And, and so I joined them in 2014. And I've been with okay. South Coast Partners since. And nice. Yeah. So what is it about recruiting per se that you, you enjoy? Well, I mean, helping people. I mean, ultimately when you have, when a, when a client calls and, and an owner or hiring manager calls and they say, you know, I really need this filled with this is a very important role and, you know, can you help? And number one, you're helping that owner or hiring manager fill a very critical role in their company. And so, that's one side of it is you're helping them. And the other side is obviously you're helping somebody either get a promotion uh, or the, you know, they just, you know, there's a lot of things that happen in the real estate industry, different management companies come in, uh, you know, portfolios are bought and sold. And, and, and so you're helping somebody that might've just gotten laid off, get a new job, uh, you know, maybe help them get more money or better benefits or a better situation. Maybe they're moving from Seattle to Houston for whatever reason, or Houston to Seattle, and you're helping with that transition. So overall, I, I just really enjoy helping people in that way. Well, that's great. And from what I understand, your business is about 80% multifamily. 
So what, right. what, what's the other portion? Like how, what else do you dip into? We work with some commercial like retail and office. Oh, okay. Uh, sector. So it's all it's all property management based then, or the research. Property real management, estate? yeah, property management, developers, and construction firms. Okay. Really, uh, we work with a lot of developers and on that side. Um, but yes, all in real estate. All in real estate. And are you mostly finding people like regional and above? Is that the main kind of like? It depends. Um, you know, property manager can mean so many different things. And that's yeah. one of the things that I'd like to talk about is, um, you know, a property manager can be over 10 units or it can be over a thousand units. And so we, we do work on critical property manager type roles. Um, yeah. But typically it's it's a uh, regional manager, executive VP, uh, you know, president of property management, vice president of development. And then finance and accounting, like controllers, the opposed, county managers, uh, like marketing, yeah. you know, pretty much anything on the executive side. Of, yeah. Uh, well, and you bring a good estate. point up about like, there is such a drastic difference. You're not going to put a, a newbie in a thousand or even even 500, probably not even 300. Like there's a threshold of like complexity when it comes to the property. Um, right, and you're not gonna throw somebody in there that's you know not a little seasoned. Right, and, right, right. And it can go the other way around. I mean, yeah, you get a property manager that was just a property manager at a thousand units, and they don't want to work at a two hundred unit property. Right, but you don't know that unless they put that information or you talk to them. Yeah, and they may not want to move up into like a regional role. They like running a small town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because it's a different job, right? Completely yeah, different job. Yeah, there's less travel. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, not everybody wants to move up in that way. They just want to make their job a little more challenging and definitely gets that way when you have those big communities. Right. Definitely. You got, you got quite the staff and all that and uh, just a lot of people, a lot of residents. So, right. But, yeah, that, that's true for sure. Is there any any tips around... You know, being that you're in that space, one of the things you were bringing up is like resume oriented things and also just keeping um, profile. I'm assuming you meant like LinkedIn and things like that um, up to date and then maybe just even. Well, it's it's your your bullet point. So I'll let you hit what you wanted to speak about. Yeah, I mean, so number one, I, I think uh, I would like people, people to realize that, you know, owners and, and hiring executives do look at profile. They look at your LinkedIn profile. They look mm -hmm. at even other social media. Like if your Facebook profile or Instagram or any of the other social medias is, is public, you know, if mm -hmm. I can see it, they can see it. And, right. you know, people do Google names and because they want to know if, if, if they're going to be working with this person, if they're going to be paying them, you know, a lot of money, then uh, investing in, in, the, in the people, they want to find out as much information as possible about the person as well. So, Number one is 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 to have your social media. If you do have social media public, then make sure that it's okay. If your if your supervisor or your the owner of a new company that you're moving to is okay seeing that social media. Yeah. And you know, a lot of the times, uh, I mean, these folks do look at the LinkedIn profile a lot, and the LinkedIn is probably the number one thing besides the resume that people go to to find out about somebody and mm -hmm. professional right now and you know a lot of people still don't even have a profile a, 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 a photo profile on linkedin mm -hmm. or if they do sometimes it's like you know the little bathroom selfie uh photo <laughs> in, that they took on you know i don't know but number one is to update your your professional photo on linkedin you know have somebody take your photo or get a traditional photographer to take your photo or, you know, use one of the AI tools now that you can get a professional uh, headshot for your LinkedIn profile. Well, um, I think at the end of the day, your profile picture should represent who you are. Like, I think, was it Marshall? Uh, what's his name? 
anyways, he's with ADT. Um, mm-hmm. He he has kind of a fun profile picture where he has like props in the background and stuff like that. So like, if you're if you're trying to represent a certain persona and you want to attract certain people, then make your profile reflect that. I mean, honestly, right. like. If you don't want to work in a real corporate environment and stuff, then, I mean, yeah, you do you. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I just think it's better to have a profile picture. Oh, sure. Than not. Yeah, and yeah. And, and at least be intentional about what you put up. <laughs> yes. Yes. Not have, like, just your forehead and uh, here you go. Well, I put a, yeah. I put a picture up. No, yeah. I mean, we, yeah. We need to put in a little bit of effort into our personal brand, you know, and that's kind of my main overall reaching uh, message, I hope, is to just have a little bit more awareness of what you're reflecting and uh, what you want to reflect and, and, and put a little effort into it. Um, because it does show like how you work, how you operate and, and, and those things. And the next thing is about the LinkedIn profile is to match your Match the LinkedIn profile with your resume as mm. far as uh, updating the LinkedIn profile with the correct dates. Like you want to have the right, the same dates on your resume as you do your LinkedIn profile. And like if you had a job, say you had a job and on your, your resume, it says 2016 to 2018. But on your LinkedIn profile, it says 2014 to 2020. Like, OK, well, what's what's going on here? Um, yeah. And also the the companies and the titles and things like that, they should be matching because what it does is just it, it creates more questions than answers. Uh, right. In a bad way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the more answer, more answers to questions you can answer by having a more robust LinkedIn profile, like you yes. go into the that meeting and they're like kind of knowing you a little bit. Yes. Yes. Um, so that, again, it all comes down to like portray who you want to be seen as, right? Um, and be authentic. I'd say, like, right? You yeah, know. your LinkedIn profile and your resume tell the story of your professional career and mm-hmm. who you are. And you know, we want that story to be clear and uh, and concise and and accurate and honest. Right. Because that's ultimately kind of what it reflects too. Like, what is this person trying to lie? About? And uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's not good. We don't want to portray that ever. Right. Um, right. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> yeah. So those are the main things with the profile and like the social media is to just really have a a photo of, of that represents you the best and matching your resume and your LinkedIn profile. Um, and then the, the, for the resume, uh, the things, there's three things for the resume that I hope can get across to people. And number one is to have like quantifiable, measurable results. Like if you're in sales or leasing, like what's your closing ratio, what's your occupancy, you know, resident satisfaction, uh, you know, retention rates, all of those things, like data, numbers. How many units is the property? If you if you you know work on a lease up, how quickly did you lease it up? Uh, it was it on time? Was it on budget? All of those things um, to have those numbers instead of just a job description on the resume uh, makes you stand out. It shows your accomplishments and it helps. Uh, if you've got twenty property managers all going out for the same job then if one person has those highlights and those, those quantifiable, measurable results, then you're, you're going to be more likely to get that interview than the other folks that yeah, don't. For sure. There's actually a question around this topic. More the cover letter situation. Um, Natasha's interested about whether or not it's an important thing and whether it should be an important thing probably. <laughs> Well, that's really an opinion question. If you want to ask sure. my personal opinion. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, we don't really use cover letters that much. Um, but we we do write a summary for our clients about our discussions and, and kind of write mm-hmm. a little summary of 
of the person and why we think they're a good fit for the role. Uh, but like your LinkedIn profile nowadays kind of is your cover letter sometimes. And I, I mean, your cover letter can be in an email. Uh, right. So it's not as important as it has been in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, because in the past, you didn't have all this social media. LinkedIn didn't exist. And the cover letter kind of told your story a little bit better. And right now, you don't really have to do that as much. So I wouldn't, if, if you're looking for a new job and you're worried about the cover letter, I really wouldn't concern yourself with the cover letter as much as the other things. Um, like having, like if your resume is good, you don't need a cover letter. Yeah. Yeah. I hope that um, answers that question sufficiently. I think it does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Joel, he's actually um, from my company. He's my boss. Um, so when I got my job, and, and this is actually a thing, uh, he just says that he likes a letter that tells you tells him why somebody is interested in this specific job and company. And I remember actually right. when it was just three years ago now, um, him sending me an email, just asking me that question. And then in email, I responded. Right. You know, in a in a more professional and long winded way, um, as to why I was interested. So right, but like asking just for a cover letter, sometimes that's like I don't know. Before before there's like interest shown, sometimes that can be challenging because it's like right. by the employer, right? Because it's like you had to write how many letter cover letters, right? Like when they ask for that, if you were looking for a job, I mean, right. There's a, that's a lot of cover letters. <laughs> yeah. It, it depends on the job. It depends on how specific it is, but I agree with Joel completely. Like yeah. the, the more specific you can make it to that company and that mm -hmm. uh, position and show that you've done the research. Like, you know, we've had some people go all the way to an interview and they don't even know like who the company, like anything about the company at all. Mm -hmm. Right. We, we, advise them to do research on the company and the, who they're interviewing with. We give them all that information. Uh, but some people don't. And, and, and it looks, you know, it's, it's not putting your best foot forward when you don't have that information. So, yeah, um, it just depends on if you're applying to a hundred jobs or you're applying to 10 jobs, um, how specific you want to make it. And I'm just curious about like, so there's cover letter and then there's a lot of softwares out there. So if somebody isn't using a recruiter, they're, you know, just applying input, inputting their resume and maybe a cover letter. It's like the system usually weeds out resumes, looks for keywords, whatever. Right. But then do they actually read all those cover letters? <laughs> That's my question. <laughs> they're asking I mean, for them, but do they, do they read them? <laughs> like, I don't, uh, I don't know. I mean, this is all my opinion. I mean, I don't know, but I don't think yeah. it's as, I don't think the cover letter is as important as the actual resume. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you can have the greatest cover letter in the world, make it very specific to the company, have a terrible resume and they're never going to mm. call you. Sure. Yeah. Especially if it, especially if it is gated through like software, because if, if the software doesn't see you having the right, attributes then you're like sol <laughs> right but i mean like joel said i mean if i was going to advise somebody and they really wanted to go for a specific job then yeah a cover letter with specifics in there with the hiring manager's information in there who you're meeting with why you're in that company could be beneficial yeah yeah yeah, there's a. I have a lot of opinions about the hiring process. I'm sure <laughs> having a recruiter as a part of it actually helps because that's like, you know, I've never actually had a recruiter help me in that way. But, but when it comes to like just blindly looking for jobs and just applying all over the place, man, there's a lot of room for improvement in this. <laughs> in yes. This, just yeah. in general. <laughs> Yes. No, I'll tell you our process. If you want to know about our process. Sure. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We get a company calls us and says, we need a director of marketing. Since you're marketing, we need a director of marketing in Seattle. Um, this is the portfolio. This is who we, you know, the type of person we want. 
Um, this is going to be the role. And then, so we take that information and we ask questions and try to get as specific as possible. We take that information and then we um, call folks directly and we call people that we know. I and mean, we've been in the ministry for 30 years. So we've got a big database of folks that we've talked to. We talk to them first to see if they may be interested or if they know of anybody that could be interested, discuss the role, discuss the company, discuss all those details, and then uh, kind of move forward from there. And then once we get their resume, we go over their resume and write a little summary for our client. If we submit them for the job, we do write a little summary um, for the, the candidates. Mm -hmm. And then we set up interviews and yeah. check references and do all of that. I've heard some people, and I like your process, some people like speak bad about recruiters, but that's probably because they've had a bad recruiter experience. You sound like you actually try to have a good experience with. The we try to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's some people out there that aren't happy with me. Uh, oh, well. But we try to. I really make an effort to make it the best experience as possible for the candidates and for our clients, for the companies. We try to follow up. I mean, most of the things that I hear that, that's for about recruiting is the follow up and mm. not telling people what happened to the interview, you know, yeah. uh, is the position filled? Uh, what right. do they think? What's the feedback? And we really try to get as much feedback as possible from the companies because the more feedback we get, the more likely we are to find the right person that they're looking for. Right. And so the more feedback we can get, the better. And we can also give that feedback back to the, the candidates. Um, yeah. And that's, I mean, that makes a lot of sense because at the end of the day, it's the only way you're getting paid, right? Like if a yes. person doesn't get placed, you don't get paid. <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah. Yes. And, and that's like, yeah. Yeah. So exactly. Anyways. And that's why we have to find the best people too, is because right. if we don't find the right person, then we don't get paid. So, right. Right. The recruiting thing is very interesting to me, like how, how recruiting companies and people get paid and stuff. I just I've always found that interesting how that how how a company that's looking for somebody like pays for that. Like and it's usually I mean, it's not cheap, really. I mean, it's a good sum of money. And I just that that whole process, I was just always surprised about like that companies will pay that much money and they do, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I can tell you a lot of the, the reason is, number one, they're looking for a, a confidential position. They can't make mm -hmm. it public. And, uh, oh, okay. and number two, some of the best people that might be um, good for the job are working and they're working 60 hours a week and they're not looking at job postings. And so oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of these companies will never even get to interview these people because the people never even knew the job existed. Mm. Uh, unless we called them and talked to them about it. Yeah. Or referrals are the same thing. But yeah. uh, some of the, the top people aren't just sitting around looking at, at job, boards, job boards. Right. That's no, true. That's a good point. Yeah. And not to say everybody that's looking for a job is a bad candidate, because that's not true. But, right. Um, but to a degree, somebody that is employed and has been with a company for a while, that shows a little bit of confidence that, oh, they must be doing a pretty good job. <laughs> yeah. And, and sometimes, I mean, timing is everything. You yeah. know, sometimes, you know, the, 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 the best person in the industry could, you know, work for a company that just sold their portfolio and they right. need to- find Right, a new especially job. in this so industry. Are, but, oh yeah. my gosh, this industry, it's always that way, right? Like- Right. Yeah. 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 So- but then again, that same person might have 20 different jobs that they're looking at. And mm -hmm. so they might not, they might stop looking at job postings after, you know, they get a certain amount of uh, interest. So sure. Yeah. No, that makes sense. There's a reason for it. No, absolutely. No, honestly, I've always been kind of intrigued by the profession. And personally, I've always liked helping people get jobs. So in the back of my mind, I'm like, maybe someday, I don't know, maybe that's where I'll get into. Yeah. Maybe. I, don't know. <laughs> I can tell you, it's not an easy profession. I can tell you oh, that. Oh, sure. 
yeah. it's not easy yeah. because you yeah. are dealing with people and people are, you know, sometimes fickle and uh, uh-huh. change their minds quickly. And right. So that can be difficult, but that's why when we do help somebody and we do help these, it's like, you just want to ring a bell and, and shout it to the rooftops because sure it's fantastic, but right. Yeah. It's not always uh, easy. I, I can see that for sure. And then there was but, one more question about kind of more. It, go ahead. You got it. No, I was just going to say a couple more things for the resume, but if you got to. Oh, sure. Sure. Well, before we get there, maybe um, somebody had a question about just adding skills to LinkedIn. Is that useful? And like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Stephanie, I think is the one that asked it. Oh yes. There are 50 skills that you can pick from. How do you pick? <laughs> like what, what should you, <laughs> what should you be? Uh, I mean, focused we, on with as that? a recruiter, we don't really look at skills a whole lot, honestly. Um, if you well, wanted to add things but to your does LinkedIn it, profile. But does it help when you do a search on LinkedIn, like you're looking for somebody, does that yeah. mean they pop up because you're looking for a certain keyword? No, I mean, if you're researching a skill, um, mm-hmm. but we typically don't search a specific skill. Um, mm-hmm. Like you don't search sales. I mean, do you know how many people would come up if you oh, search sure. a sales skill in Seattle? Like, yeah. <laughs> there would be yeah. 100,000 people that came up, you know? But you did ask me recently about like somebody that's like super experienced in like lease ups versus right. somebody. And so I would say if you love lease ups, then that's something to add to your LinkedIn profile yes. because somebody could search you specific to that. Yes. That's what I was going to get to. It's like, oh, okay. you know, the LinkedIn ahead. skills is like customer service, sales, mm-hmm. management, uh, you know, those kind of things. And they're very general and not really real estate specific a lot of the times. Uh, right. We do search like real estate. So you want to have like your industry is real estate. If you're in real estate, you don't want to have... Right. It, 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 like in accounting, because, uh, you know, we search real estate for a lot of the times, but having the specifics like that, like lease ups, software systems that you've worked with, um, you know, renovations, CapEx work, if you've done that value add, um, affordable housing, low income, you know, uh, light tech, section eight, HUD, um, all these specific things that somebody would be looking for that would separate you from another person or separate you from a different niche, student housing, um, military housing, you know, all these little subsets of real estate property management or just real estate in general, development, analysts work, um, those different, you know, software systems are big because some people like, I want somebody with Entrada experience. Right. Um, or yeah, lease up is a big one, or I want somebody that has a CapEx experience or value add experience or, mm-hmm. or light tech experience, you know, so we'll, we will search those specific things. Um, so that, yeah. I think that would be more important putting on your LinkedIn profile than worrying about what type of skills to have. On. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And then maybe even be specific, like lease up, it was where it was located, how many units it was, how quickly you leased it up, that kind of thing. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. 100%. Because yeah. that's going to come up in an interview. Like if, if you're sitting in an interview and, and, and they want lease of experience, they're going to talk about the lease of experience that you have. So if it's great, you you, you should put it on your LinkedIn profile as well as, as, well as your resume for sure. Yeah. Do you use ads and things to recruit people on LinkedIn? Uh, we do not. No. Yeah. Stephanie just was making a comment that she's acting as recruiter for her company right now. Maybe she needs to talk to you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> not, I, and, and if we can't help, I'm open, I'm always open to giving tips and suggestions and things that I've learned because, like we were just talking about in the very beginning of this, is it's a it's a community effort, you know, and. Yeah. I can help, you know, I I really believe in helping somebody now, maybe, you know, just helping just to help somebody, but you never know what's going to happen in five years from now. too. Yeah. 
like and, burning bridges is a big thing too that I wanted to talk about or okay in go general ahead role in multifamily is just yeah not to burn any bridges and try to create bridges with everybody you can uh yeah. because it's a it's a very large industry but it's small at the same time with all these association events conferences uh especially with these social media uh meetings like this mm -hmm. um people talk and yep they and will it's not call that big an former, it's a, like it's a big small industry <laughs> yes yes definitely so, it's big but it's small especially yeah. when people get higher up right so definitely yeah yep and they're gonna ask um, their buddy how, what do you think of this person it yes like you like especially if you're connected to them on linkedin yes they're ask you what was it like working with them or whatever yes. so yeah yep. it happens all the time it happens more yep. than i think people realize yeah. like if you see hey this person was a property manager at this property oh i used to you know i know somebody who used to be a regional manager over there i'm going to call them up and say well what do you know about this person yeah absolutely yeah because i mean at the end of the day you want a, a good hire good bad hires are expensive yes <laughs> yes and in and in your world isn't there like a threshold of a certain amount of time they need to stay with the company yeah even? Typically, it's, uh, it'll be 90 days um, is a standard. And so if somebody doesn't work out for whatever reason within 90 days, then um, we'll do the whole search again for free. Yeah. And, Which yeah. you don't want to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard enough finding one person. Try finding two. Exactly. <laughs> and to do it for free the next time. Yeah, that's not free. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that doesn't sound like a good time at all. Um, <laughs> you don't want to be a recruiter anymore, do you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I would just be perfect at it. All my placements, <laughs> everybody never... works out. No, absolutely. Issues. Yeah, yeah. What's I guess that's a, that's a good question. If you want to tip your hat to this, what's the retention rate of people that get hired? Like, how For often us? do you have? Yeah, yeah, it doesn't. It ours is pretty high. I mean, it really doesn't happen. There's so many hoops to go through that we have to get to the right person and the process that we've refined it over 30 years so much that it really doesn't happen that much um but it does happen still i mean there's you can do everything in the world and and, and people i mean like i said we're dealing with people so yeah. you know people change their mind their situations just weren't the same but as long as we get as much information up front, because we try to be as open and honest with the, the clients about expectations as well as the candidates and be open and front about the companies and what their benefits are, what the situation is, what the role is. If you're as upfront and honest as possible, then there's less likely it's not going to work out because everybody has all the information they need and there's very little surprises once they start. Right. But what happens is when it usually doesn't work out is there's some kind of surprise like you didn't tell me this about this position no. yeah yeah well it's good that it doesn't happen too often gosh that would be annoying yes. probably wouldn't last very long as a recruiter if it happened all the time <laughs> no. No. both out of frustration and the person that hired you probably wouldn't want you all right yeah you won't last yes correct yeah. yeah. Well, it was a good effort. I think you need to find a new place to work and yes. just maybe not recruiting. I just. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's why it's important. I mean, like you said, we, we've been doing it for 30 years and I've been doing it for nine years. And so you don't get to be doing it for that long if it's not successful. Right. Yeah. No, that's true. Was there anything else you wanted to add around that topic? Yes, yeah, for the resume, the other things were that it's okay to have a two or three page resume. Like a lot of people just think you can have, you just, you, you have to have a one page resume. But I'm here to tell you that it's okay to have a two or three page resume, especially if you've been working for over five years. And because you, you know, to, to put the information that's needed, like all these quantifiable information on there, your software skills, uh, all of your experience. It, it sometimes it takes two or three pages and 
that's okay. I mean, it, it, it doesn't take a whole lot of extra effort to read a second or third page. I mean, it maybe take two or three minutes. So, and, so I'm assuming the key though is not just a bunch of paragraphs, right. make it bullet points and data showing your success. Right. Like you can have three or four bullet points about the job description, but not have an entire page of a job description for a property manager. And then the second page is another job description for a property manager. And it was the same job, you know, it's, it's the same bullets. Like I see yeah, that yeah. a lot. And that is kind of, uh, no, nobody wants to read the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why it's important that if you have that quantifiable information, you stand out and, and not yeah. just have a job description. Yeah. Listed on there. For sure. Yeah. So it's okay to have a two, three page resume. And, and this goes for other industries too. Like I, you know, I used to work in healthcare. It was okay to have a two, three page resume in healthcare. Uh, I've talked to tech recruiters and they say the same thing. Finance and accounting folks say the same thing. So, I mean, if, if you make the first page correctly with all this information and make it, you know, you want to go to the second page and it's okay. And the other thing about that is to get two, three pages. Like if you have 20 years of experience, you want to show the progression in your career. Like if you started off as a leasing agent and now you're a vice president of property management, well, people want to see, you know, how did you get there? How did that happen? Mm. What's that story? And, you know, sometimes it takes two or three pages to tell that story. And, and if you, if you just have on the resume, I've got 20 years of multifamily experience, but you only show five years, it leaves a lot of questions. Like what happened yeah. the other 15 years? What were you doing? How did you become a right. VP? And so it's a, like, it's okay to tell that story. Sure. In the resume. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always confused about what format to put a resume in. Like, are you supposed to like, is there a certain point where your education is less important and shouldn't necessarily be the like first thing or is in, is it mostly like showcasing experience once you've really been in an industry for a while? And it's like, nobody, for, first of all, if you've been out of college for 20 years, nobody cares your GPA. I'm sure like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is true. That's true. <laughs> They might care about what you studied, I guess. Yes. You know, yeah. Yes. If it, if it relates to your job, you know, I yeah. mean, there are real estate degrees now and uh, marketing degrees. If you, you got a marketing degree, you're in marketing, then it's very relevant. Um, sure. So, I mean, I think education is still important depending on what education it is. Um, sure. You know, a lot of people put their high school still on there and I don't think that's, is important um, to put your high school first on the on the resume, right. um, uh, but ex having the right experience and showing the experience is is the yeah. most important. Uh, yeah, it depends on the job too. Like if you're going out for a development job, like a VP of development, usually they want to see an MBA or a master's in real estate development. Or if you're an analyst, you know, a lot of folks want to see that finance or accounting degree. So yeah, it just depends on the job mainly. Yeah. But if you went to school for sociology or something, I don't know. I've always 30 always years pick ago. On, yeah, yeah. 30 years ago. It's like, eh, I mean. <laughs> yeah. They're gonna care more about your experience. And a lot of people value these um, certifications. Well, there's a lot of industry certifications. So if you have right. those, I mean, by all means, yes. like list those at the top of the resume. If you've got a CPM or CAPS or CAM or, um, mm -hmm. you know, NALP for leasing, um, you know, list those on the resume. Be proud of those accomplishments. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Because sometimes, you know, going back to the skills question is, uh, especially in affordable housing, people will want a... A COS, you know, certified occupancy specialist, or an HCCP, and so we'll search those certifications uh, because our clients, you know, want somebody with that certification because it tells you that you you've got that education in that specific niche. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's and it's it's totally valuable to to get those continuing education 
like go to your local affiliate, take those classes. Um, especially if, I mean, there's a lot of people that are in the industry that they didn't necessarily go to college and have been very successful. I've talked to a lot of them. Um, but there is opportunities to learn more about the specific industry. Like once you're in here and you know, this is going to be where you're continuing, go and get credentials, go get educated, go get your real estate license, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 It definitely doesn't hurt. No, absolutely. Yeah. (laughs) And then the other thing, the last thing I want to talk about for the resume is making sure you have the correct tense um, for the jobs for the bullet points, like the job descriptions, for instance, like like past, present, and future tenses for the verbs. Mm. If you worked in a job, you know, 20 years ago, and you, you left there 15 years ago, meaning you have not worked in that job for 15 years, then it should be the past tense verbs for the res. like, mm. you know, you you oversaw, you, you processed, and you're not actively doing those things because you haven't right. done them for 15 years. So it shouldn't be present tense verbs. You know, you're not yeah. overseeing anything right now on that job that you haven't worked at in 15 years. And right. So, um, you know, if, if you say you have attention to detail, then th- that's one of the things is, is much as punctuation and spelling and grammar on the resume is anything is right. making sure that the, the right verb tense is, is on the right job. The only thing that should be present tense is your current job on the resume. Right. It's, it's definitely showcasing whether or not you have an attention to detail. <laughs> <laughs> you said so, but mm, I don't. Yeah. I don't see it in your resume. So. Yeah. So yeah. that's just. Those are a few things that I think get missed. Like it's very simple, basic things that can really boost somebody's resume and LinkedIn profile. Uh, adding these things and for the measurable results i mean anytime you um accomplish something in your career you know it could be a month it could be every six months it could be every year but update their linkedin profile update your resume whether you're looking for a job or not i think Mm. is is helpful because you know even if like you're not looking for a job now and two years later you are looking for a job uh you might have forgotten what happened two years ago in that accomplishment what were those numbers i don't know i forget i gotta go look yeah so your linkedin when you when you list your job in the summary below it you would suggest putting those wins kind of in there i would definitely okay because i don't even like i can i know for a fact that i don't do that (laughs) (laughs) I mean, if you want a owner or a hiring executive, a future owner or future executive to see it, then put it on there by all means. Yeah, sure. I mean, you did it. It's a great accomplishment. Be proud of right. it. You know, list right. it on there. Sure. Yeah, that's a good point. Cool. Well, if there's nothing else on that particular topic, I know there was still a few other or another topic we did want to cover. And that was around the topic of health and just taking care of yourself. And I know yes. you personally, um, when we spoke before, just shared your personal journey with that. So, I mean, I think it's a good story and a good example of why. <laughs> yeah. And I'll tell you, I mean, first of all, I, I'm not a psychologist or a therapist or anything like that. So, uh, you know, this is just my personal opinion and personal journey. And um, but I do think, you know, this topic of mental health and you know, performance and having energy and all of these things are really top of mind. And I love to see it in the National Apartment Association and in our industry. Companies are starting to come up with different programs like Gables Residential has a fantastic program for benefits and health and, and all of these things. So I'm glad that that we're finally, you know, moving towards uh, opening up the conversation, at least in yeah. health. And right. And I really personally believe that, you know, the healthier we are, the better we perform, you know, the the longer tenure we can have in a job. And it's just the better we are at leading people. And I just think there's so many benefits to getting healthy 
whether that be physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally. Um, I, I think it's crucial. I mean, these are just observations. I mean, from, from being on the recruiting side, I mean, we talk to a lot of top performers in the industry and we obviously talk with a lot of the hiring executives and, you know, a lot of them do prioritize their health um, in, in, in their personal life and in professional life. And so if you are looking to continue growing and I think, you know, health should be a high priority for all of us. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, Cause I mean, you can't, you can't do a stressful job if you don't take care of yourself, you can for a time, but eventually it catches up to you and then you have that heart attack or you have whatever because your body couldn't handle it. Right. And, and, you know, NAA did a survey about mental health and they found that the stress level continues to rise even from COVID levels. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's continued in 2023. Like people are more stressed in 2023 than they were in 2021 and 2022. Right. And I think that's very telling. And, you know, I, I, I love all these companies that are, that are making it a, priority and, and awareness. Um, but I just think, you know, maybe there could be a little bit more for the daily activities of uh, folks. And that's, you know, really where I think it is, is kind of lost a little bit. Um, you know, some of these things like a day at the spa once a year, I don't think um, is very helpful over the long term. Um, mm -hmm. Because you know, a month after that day in the spa, like, you know, you forget about that. And, yeah. but it's the little, the day-to-day the -day activities that I think we can improve. And there's many different things. I mean, I'm just here to share, you know, my own personal opinion. This is not the opinion of my company or anything like that, but I have seen the benefits of uh, improving health in my own life and in the lives of others. And, you know, well, I've been, uh, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, cause yeah, you, you were in a place of really poor health, right? Yes. Like, yeah. yeah, I was 30 pounds heavier than I am right now. And, um, poor eating habits, you know, I started dating my wife in 2014 and she got tired of me sitting on the couch watching sports <laughs> all the time and just eating potato chips and like, but my diet was horrible and I would just go to work and go home and like, and sit there. And, um, and on the weekends I just watched sports and sat on the couch and, and, and it's weird because like we, we get in these habits of these bad habits. Uh, and, and I wasn't even really aware of what I was doing to myself. Um, until she said something about, are you just gonna is this what our life is gonna be you sitting on the couch watching sports all day and like i don't want to have this happen uh every weekend you know it's not yeah. the life i want to live and she had been running and she had signed up for a, a half marathon with a friend and she was a part of this run group and i went out there they started in july in texas it was horrible it was 100 degrees uh, went out there the first time, uh, didn't even make a mile on, on the run. And I thought, this is, I couldn't, it, it was terrible. Um, sweating the whole time. I couldn't breathe. Uh, you know, I used to be a smoker too. I, I stopped smoking and, and, but it was just horrible. And, and I, I realized at that time, like, I've got some serious health issues. And it was affecting my personal relationships. It was, you know, affecting me personally with performance. You know, I wasn't performing. I wasn't clearly thinking as I am now. Um, but they said, listen, there's this, there's this group that runs for five minutes and walks for a minute. And I said, okay, I can run for five minutes and walk for a minute. I can do that. You know, they said there's some like 60 year olds in there. And at the time I was like 31, 32. And <laughs> they said, listen, if these folks could do it, like you could do it, trust me. And, uh, and so I did that and I joined the group, ran for five minutes, walked for a minute and went all the way. And I, 
uh, in January of that year. So six months later, I ran a half marathon, uh, running for five minutes and walking for a minute. They would blow the whistle and we all did it together. And it was such a great time. And, and it was, it was very difficult. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it was very challenging, but at the end of it, I'm so happy, you know, proud of myself for that accomplishment. And, and then I've, I've continued exercising ever since then. And that was in 2017. And um, so, but what I've realized is when I work out physically, like I feel better mentally, you know, it's, it's, it's been proven. There's a lot of studies, you can Google them, but when we, when we exercise, we release endorphins Mm -hmm. and, and it's almost like in dopamine and which is good for us and and that good feeling. And it makes us clearly uh, think better and ultimately perform better on top of that. And I'm not advocating like going out and running a half marathon or anything, but even just like walking for a a couple miles a day, if you're doing nothing, you know, there's a book, Atomic Habits, and I love it because it's exactly how I started um, the habit of exercise this time is just doing whatever you can and, and build up. And, um, so physically and mentally, I think the two are combined. They go hand in hand. And then the other thing is, is what we put into our body. You know, I, um, I've been sober since 2013 and I used to drink every single day. I would go to work and, On the way home, I would buy, you know, alcohol and and just drink myself to sleep. And 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 I was doing it every day. And and I thought, you know, I'm working, I'm successful, you know, I was selling, uh, I was doing good at work and in 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 sales, (laughs) but I didn't feel good Hmm. physically and I didn't feel good mentally because you know, I was just going home and, and drinking and, um, and, you know, really limited my ability to, to, to create community, um, with those habits. Right. Um, and so now being sober for, for 10 years, um, you know, I'm not saying everybody needs to get sober, but if you are drinking every day, then, uh, you know, they're, they're, I, I'm not here to, force anything on anybody. I'm just saying this is what happened to me is, uh, you know, I got sober, went through a, a recovery program and it really helped uh, with my emotions, my mentality and my physical health. And um, I just, I'm a bit advocate of it, you know, just talking about it, just making people aware that there is another way to live. Right. Um, right. And you can have fun. You can enjoy yourself. My wife and I, we travel to Hawaii. We go to Costa Rica. We go to Mexico. We go all over the place. Um, I can still have good relationships and you don't always have to get drunk to to cope with the stress, to cope with life, to have friends. Um, right. Which I used to think, you know. Yeah. Um, well, and and when done unhealthily. For sure. Not to say there's any amount of alcohol that's that really healthy for you because it's <laughs> not. <laughs> but well, there's there's thresholds of like you yes. drank too much and now you're making bad decisions while also drinking. And you're and you, like relationship wise, things you're doing that are wrecking your relationships or things you're saying or and it's like, well, you're saying you know, all doing all these things because you are drunk. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And you can say bad things to your boss and maybe not have a job the next day, you know? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. But I'm no, so, like, it's very, I was just going to say, it's surprising when you hear about people that it's so bad that they are drunk all day long. Yes. Like that they have to maintain a, a, basically a level of being drunk in order to feel normal. It's like, yikes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, my wife, she drinks, she can drink half a glass of wine and then put it down and, and, and not drink, you know, mm-hmm. anything. And she's, she's fine. She's great. 
Me, on the right. other hand, I, I can't. Um, I drink half a glass of wine, and I got to have the whole bottle and, and then another bottle. And and, yeah. uh, and that's when it turns into an issue. You know? Right, right. You wake up the next day, right. you're hungover. You know, like you said, you got to drink at lunch or, you know, uh, be drunk on the job. And, and that's it, it, it affects almost it affected every aspect of my life. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. Well, congratulations. That's a, it's a great accomplishment, especially when you know it has negative effects on your life and to maintain that is, is great. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> but so, there's a lot of people out there and, and um, right. you know, there's a lot of people that don't have to have alcohol in their lives right. every day and they're living very happy lives. And, and that's, that's, that's kind of actually what, that totally and honestly it's kind of an it's been a thing i've seen brought up more and more lately is there's the pressure of like when you go even to naa we'll say right um a big aspect of naa is social socializing and going out at night right and there's parties and all this stuff and big aspect of that is alcohol and like people always ask the question oh you're not drinking and, and it makes you feel like there's something wrong with that. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> But you know what I found is like most people don't care. You know, no. I'll get an Arnold Palmer where it's tea yeah. and lemonade and have a great time. The people who really care are the ones that are insecure about it themselves. And like, mm. you might need to look at your drinking if you really care if I'm drinking or not. <laughs> right, right. But most, most folks, they don't. They only care about what they're drinking. Right. Right. Yep. That's true. And yeah, if they make a big deal out of it, it's like, all right, well, you're probably not the person I'm going to hang out with tonight. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that. Was there any, anything else, uh, anything that you want to touch on relating to that? No, I mean, just, I really wanted to convey, like, it's okay to ask for help too. Like if you need yeah. help, you know, it's okay to get into a, a program for exercise or your mental health health or um you know there's a show that i've been watching suits i don't know if you've ever seen suits i, I know what it is but i haven't seen it no yeah well they i mean it, it's got nine seasons really successful but there are these high-powered attorneys in new york and but in the show they like make it they normalize fitness they normalize talking with a therapist or a psychiatrist and i think that's so fantastic you know because they these these high powered New York attorneys from Harvard and Columbia and and they're they're showing these folks going to therapists or going to psychologists and and, and getting active and exercising and uh, and I think that's fantastic because I do think it's okay to to have those things and, and there hasn't there doesn't have to be a stigma to right. doing those things right exactly yeah. Yeah, and Stephanie, she even brought up there is kind of a trend of people just choosing not to drink, like younger folks, and they're just they're drinking like cocktails, but mocktails instead, yeah. stuff like that. And yeah. and again, it's like, yeah, you can't have fun. You don't have to consume alcohol. Yeah. I mean, I I do drink on occasion, not very often, but if I have more than I should, which is like two or three, because I don't <laughs> drink enough to like have a tolerance, um, my body, yeah, it doesn't respond well. Uh, like it doesn't like it because it's toxins. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, it is. It is. It's a toxin. It's a, and it's a depressant. And so right. people are like, I don't know why I'm depressed all the time. Well, how much are you, you drinking? Well, I drink every day. Well, yeah, have something to do with it. Yeah, yeah, yep. It's but true. like I said, I mean, to each their own. Like, I'm not here to like. I just, I just wanted to show another side. Sure. To that situation. Yeah. Yeah. I, definitely. I don't mean to belittle anybody who does drink. I, I know a ton of people who do drink. My fan, all my family drinks. My wife drinks. Like, I'm not completely against drinking. Just for myself and for some people, it might not be good for them. Yeah. And I think it's good to bring up the fact that sometimes, I mean, a lot of times 
we turn to a substance or a thing and it doesn't even have to be alcohol. It could be working out even sometimes where you're like addicted to it, but it's, it's roots are in like avoidance of something. Right. Right. So if you're going to alcohol so much, what are you avoiding? Right. Trying to escape reality for some yeah. reason. Right. Yeah. So anyways, definitely, definitely, definitely something to keep in mind for anybody. Like what, what is in your life that you're going to um, social media yeah. or whatever to, it uh, can be video life. games, you know, video games is a big one right now with the young folks. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Um, the young folks. I sound, I feel like young folks. So <laughs> I know. Well, we are <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, like, what are you? Yeah. What are you trying to escape reality from? What are you? Yeah. From? yeah. Get real. Well, Yep. Well, it's a, it's an important topic and I've had a few people talking about mental health and stuff on the show. So it's been really good to, to get that out there. And that, like you said, that companies are taking notice and taking action, um, as much as they can, but at the end of the day, it's really our own health and we got to take action for ourselves at the end of the day. Really? I mean, right. You know, one thing that companies them. could do is, you know, make it okay to go to counseling or, you know, have counseling as a part of their EAP programs. Mm. Um, you know, that could be one of the benefits that company could incorporate. Uh, sure. Because it can be expensive. Yes. Yeah. I think each each session ranges anywhere from like just under a hundred to like, depending on who you're seeing, 200 bucks. And that's, yes. I mean, that's nothing to... <laughs> That's a right. lot. Right. So that's uh, that's a big it can be a big barrier for people. So Yeah. But, and it's an investment for the company too because if you have a healthier employee afterwards that's going to stay with you longer mm-hmm. and ultimately it's an investment in that employee and and help the company long term. Right. Yep. And to Stephanie's point, tell the employees or remind them the EA, the EAP EAP. exists. Yes. Like it's there, but is it ever talked about reminding people, Hey, this is what you get with it. Um, Cause it's usually talked about when you're hired and that's all. (laughs) Right. No, that's, that's a huge point. Yeah. Yeah. People don't even know what's in your benefit package. Right. Yep. For sure. Well, David, I really appreciate you talking on that subject and just, also sharing about the recruiting uh, part of your life and the tips around resumes and everything else. It's definitely something that there's a lot of people in that boat of looking for a job and um, any tips they can get, I'm sure are welcomed for sure. And my pleasure. Thank you, Evan, for having me. And if anybody wants to have a, you know, please reach out. I'm active on LinkedIn and I'm happy to set up a call. Yeah, absolutely. Reach out to him. LinkedIn. That's why, you know, when when people aren't active on LinkedIn, I'm always surprised. It's like they don't realize the power of it. Um, there's a lot to to embrace around it. A lot of frustrations around LinkedIn sometimes, too. But uh, but that's more like because they need to make it better. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much the people. It's like LinkedIn. Stop making it so difficult. Anyways. <laughs> that's true. They need to listen to the the uh, users more, I think. Um, but anyways, don't cancel me, LinkedIn. This is where my show <laughs> goes. <laughs> but again, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for everybody that participated, asked questions, and added their uh, comments. Really appreciate it. Uh, this has been Boss Talks episode 55. Uh, Till next week. Actually, not next week. I'm taking a break. I'm going on vacation. Going to Hawaii for my anniversary so should be fun uh i will be back the following week so i'll see you then uh so check us out for episode 56 then and again david thank you so much for being here with me and everyone else thanks evan